right. Hi, everybody. We're back in the, uh, the locker room again today, and we're um, stepping uh, forward from uh, the discussion of alcohol and sort of the acute alcohol intake and the associated intoxication that, uh, that comes with that uh, that we talked about in the last segment. And we're going to talk uh, about alcoholism or the more um, uh, chronic use of alcohol and, uh, and, and kind of what we look like uh, uh, when we're under uh, chronic influences of that toxin. So uh, just to go back and summarize, uh, in the last uh, segment on alcohol, we talked about looking at alcohol through the lens of threat and safety and pointed out that you know we have our threat column here and in the physical threat column we have toxins and if we just look at alcohol in terms of it being a toxin and not so much uh, in terms of it how it interfaces uh, you know directly or indirectly even with uh, different uh, neurotransmitter type receptors but just think of it as a toxin we have a pretty good explanation for um, uh, all, all of most of uh, the uh, effects of alcohol. Um, so we're going to do the same here. We're going to look at alcoholism under the lens of threat versus safety. Again, focusing more under uh, under the category of threat uh, and in thinking of alcohol as uh, a toxin. So uh, with that in mind, I want to go back and just quickly summarize. Uh, what we talked about uh, last time uh, uh, when we were discussing acute alcohol intoxication and what happens because it has uh, obviously some relevance to the chronic use of alcohol as well. So um, let's, uh, let's start with uh, uh, this idea of uh, alcohol uh, or all toxins in fact stimulate uh, a defense response in our body and part of that defense response is to do resource allocation and prioritize uh, uh, resources. And, and so certain functions in our body tend to get turned off uh, when we're in threat mode. Uh, and alcohol does a very nice job of turning down our uh, prefrontal cortex function. That's the part of the brain uh, that is uh, kind of almost distinctly human. It's quite large in humans. And, and what, it, what is in the uh, in, in the prefrontal cortex that uh, might be going offline. Well, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is responsible for reasoning, planning, judgment, and creativity. Uh, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex uh, is, uh, helps us with uh, connection and, and, and empathy and bonding with other people. And then most notably, we talked a lot about this in the last segment, the medial prefrontal cortex is that part of the brain uh, that uh, houses a lot of our social uh, kind of sense and, and social calculation, social norms, social constructs, and really has a lot to do with uh, the, the, the need to's and the have to's and the musts and the shoulds that we live with in our life. Um, so here we have, you know, kind of a, a lot of different sort of a, a constructs that uh, are, are uh, in the uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, and, uh, and most notably, these, these kind of social constructs um, create this, this sort of tug of war between uh, the emotional network that really you know, starts low down and comes up and, and the, sort of the apex of that emotional network is the, the nucleus accumbens, the uh, emotions, meaning t you know, to move. The, uh, the, the physiology is meant to get us to, to move. Um, and, uh, so as these emotions flow forward and want us to do something and move, sometimes the medial prefrontal cortex gives feedback that, no, nah, that's not appropriate right now. You know, don't do that or you should do this or uh, you, should, you need to do this. And so it inhibits the flow of uh, emotions to movement, you know. And, uh, and, and so you can have... You know, uh, anytime you have motion without without movement, you know, it's like a tire spinning. You create a rut. You can get stuck there. So, so we have some uh, some of this inhibitory input from the medial prefrontal cortex that's kind of blocking that. And we we talked about the fact that when you you know when you take your initial 
uh, sips or you know a drink or two of alcohol, what sometimes we feel is this enormous sense of uh, euphoria and then kind of excitement and we're a little bit activated and and uh, and and that's really just turning off the medial prefrontal cortex and taking away the restraint on on the emotions and letting us you know kind of feel more free and that's very satisfying and that that is associated with. Um, you know, dopamine from the ventral tegmentum here, this is substantia nigra and ventral tegmentum, uh, but most specifically the ventral tegmentum coming through the striatum to kind of its tip, and you get this big flush of dopamine, also serotonin, a little bit of norepinephrine likely as well, but you feel really good at that point, and that, that is a, a, a sensation that will come back for it, right? This, this network is not only about emotions and moving, it's also about reward and pleasure. Seeking. So that's been freed by alcohol, um, but it's been done through a, a stress response, uh, a, a, a toxicity response to, to uh, kind of uh, shut down the prefrontal cortex. It sort of retracts and, 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 and gets very quiet in, uh, under threat conditions uh, for resource allocation. So um, that, that was a lot of what we talked about last time, and that, but we also kind of got in, into some uh, other aspects of uh, certain things that can be going on uh, at a cellular level, at a level even of the mitochondria under threat. The mitochondria uh, change their shape, uh, in fact they undergo fission and become distinctly different in configuration, they lose their redundant internal membrane that does oxidative phosphorylation and we move more to glycolytic uh, processes uh, for metabolism which delivers a lot less energy to us than oxidative phosphorylation um, and uh, within, within that context of threat the cells are also um, spitting out uh, the, um, the threat type cytokines, the interleukin-1 betas, interleukin-2s, interleukin-6, interleukin six, tumor necrosis factor alpha are coming out under threat. So we remember those types of cytokines, the threat cytokines are pro-inflammatory and, 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 and catabolic and very important for survival in, uh, in threat uh, type conditions, particularly like if a tiger is chasing you. Uh, but we also mentioned that, you know, the next morning once all the alcohol is gone and we wake up and we feel terrible, the traditional model is, well, it's a, it's a metabolic effect that your alcohol has been metabolized to aldehyde and uh, acetaldehyde makes you feel terrible and that's what it is. But it probably really has more to do with this uh, hangover effect of these pro-inflammatory cytokines still uh, being around. Um, that very much give you all of the, the symptoms of a hangover, uh, 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 fatigue and headache and uh, muscle ache and nausea. That's, that's very much kind of a cytokine syndrome. So I think we're better hanging our hat on the cytokines as, as being part of the hangover than necessarily um, uh, acetaldehyde being the major player uh, in that. And, um, so that, that's, that is kind of a quick summary of our last uh, go around, um, but uh, you know, let's, let's take a moment and go up here and, and review kind of the neurotransmitters because that tends to be where we live in, in our theories is uh, neural wiring and neurotransmitters, when, particularly when we're dealing with the brain and, and you know, we have to kind of start understanding that it, that, that ends up being a relatively superficial uh, kind of look at uh, uh, at uh, all, everything that's going on in neuro, uh, neurophysiology. So last time we did talk about that, you know, in acute alcohol intoxication, there's some discussion that perhaps, um, uh, you know, there's a GABAergic flow. Uh, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So the thought was that maybe that kind of relaxes us and, and that um, also there's, there, there's some discussion out there that uh, acute alcohol intake may um, block glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, in our body, the most kind of prevalent neurotransmitter in our body. Those, those are kind of our most primitive neurotransmitters too. Um, and uh, 
um, and kind of the, the, the debate around whether that, that is accurate or not, because there, there, there is a disconnect between uh, the stages of uh, intoxication, the euphoria and the excitement and the hyperkinetic nature that then goes all the way down to being stuporous and, and comatose and dying kind of thing. You know, clearly uh, we can't, you know, explain uh, all of that, but what we do know uh, with um, chronic alcohol use, you know, alcoholism or chronic use, uh, is that that is uh, dis distinctively a hyper uh, glutaminergic state, uh, high levels of glutamine with low GABA and low dopamine, low serotonin, uh, and the uh, endo opioids, um, I think, are still not really clear. So that, that's a state that, uh, you know, is, is uh, more can, uh, consistent with, uh, you know, a chronic disease type state. Um, so we'll uh, move away from that and, and kind of get to the topic today, uh, which is, you know, the, the, what we see with uh, chronic intake uh, of alcohol. So, you know, again, the first thing we want to do is recognize alcohol is a toxin. Uh, and that activates the, 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 the threat signaling uh, in our bodies, okay? And so as we talked about before, one of the first things that can happen when, when you get a threat signal to a cell is you're gonna get um, some release, you know, usually the sort of prepackaged uh, cytokines, but eventually uh, you're gonna get a change in, in uh, transcription. Let's just put a, let's put a little nucleus on this cell with some genetic code in there, okay, you're gonna get a little change in the transcription of what's going on in the cell and it's gonna produce more things that are specific to a threat response like uh, uh, the uh, transcription of more uh, threat type cytokines and other things, you know, the, and gonna create more uh, of the uh, stuff that divides, the, causes the uh, fissuring in the, in, in the mitochondria and, and that type of thing. So we see a definite physiologic change. You know, we're always talking about nuclear factor uh, kappa B and uh, the inflammasomes and under a threat response. So all of that's getting uh, jacked up and the mitochondria are changing and we're flipping to more glycolytic or glycolysis for me metabolism, glycolytic metabolism. We're switching away from oxidative phosphorylation. Um, we talked about the mitochondria changing their shape. With the oxygen we're not using for oxidative phosphorylation, now we're producing reactive oxygen species, uh, which are pro-inflammatory in general, and they're the reason we eat our blueberries is to, as antioxidants to, to, to neutralize those uh, uh, pro-inflammatory oxygen species. So we're doing, doing that. We also know that when we impair oxidative phosphorylation, we impair fatty acid uh, uh, oxidation as well, you know, it's beta oxidation of the fatty acids. So lipid or fat metabolism gets disrupted and the fatty acids now get diverted to uh, arachidonic acid, which then goes down the prostaglandins pathway to increase inflammation in the body. And that is uh, why we take our ibuprofen type stuff, right, to, to block the prostaglandins pathway. Um, uh, so, to, so there, you know, there's a lot of changes going on uh, within the cell, and, and, and let's talk just a little bit about glutamate. It's not something we focus on very much in these threat and safety talks, but it's so uh, relevant here we, that it's worth taking just a moment. That glutamate is, you know, technically kind of our our threat uh, neurotransmitter. It is it, it it does a lot in us in terms of um, uh, creating uh, pathways in the brain, uh, creating uh, memories in the brain, um, and, uh, and, and activating uh, the brain. But it doesn't activate the entire brain, as we've talked about. You know, uh, it, in, in threat conditions, we, we, don't, we don't activate uh, the prefrontal cortex, we don't activate um, you know, the hippocampus, we don't activate our advanced language centers, we tend to actually shut those down. But glutamate, uh, particularly driven by uh, the amygdala uh, and its branches uh, under threat to activate the limbic structures and the brain stem structures, is very important uh, in uh, a danger response, in a threat response. 
And I think this is interesting in, in particular in terms of uh, uh, alcoholism because of uh, what we tend to see uh, in uh, liver disease or um, even threat-related conditions like sepsis, uh, but viral liver infections and alcoholic liver disease is this elevation in liver function tests, okay? So we'll see elevated GGT and ALT and ASD, or as I you know, learned years and years ago, SGOT and SGPT. These are the transaminases, and a lot of what's going on uh, with, uh, with transaminases is uh, increasing the levels of glutamate uh, through various mechanisms. Uh, you know, and the spin-off product of taking glutam glutamine to glutamate is actually ammonia, and uh, high ammonia levels in, in uh, liver failure can become uh, an increasing problem. So, um, uh, so we want to conceptualize that the body as is very active in producing glutamate. It also makes adjustments uh, to allow glutamate to stay in the neural uh, synapses longer. Um, the ability to transport the uh, glutamate out you know, gets collected by the astrocytes and then uh, re, uh, rebuilt into glutamine. Uh, that gets uh, inhibited as well. And in fact, uh, the progression from glutamine to glutamate, uh, another step is converting glutamate to GABA. So GABA, GABA uh, gamma amino butyric acid and glutamate are just one uh, enzyme away from each other in production and one's very activating and one is more inhibitory. Uh, one, I should say, maybe is excitatory and one is inhibitory. So um, under threat conditions, uh, that enzyme to convert uh, glutamate to GABA also gets throttled down. So we see kind of this parallel of you know, jacking up glutamate receptors, jacking up glutamate, jacking up uh, uh, the length of time glutamate stays in the synapse. It's all happening uh, in threat conditions and, and, and uh, including uh, alcohol uh, toxicity. Uh, and at the same time, we're down-regulating GABA, down-regulating GABA receptors, and, and so we don't have, uh, you know, that uh, inhibitory and perhaps more calming uh, neurotransmitter available to us. And that's why I, I kind of re recoil a little bit at the thought that, uh, that this, this, uh, this calming effect that we love from alcohol comes uh, from uh, a GABAergic nature of the alcohol. I think what we're really seeing is inhibition, toxic inhibition of the prefrontal cortex that briefly allows the dopamine and serotonin flow that makes us feel better. At the same time, I believe we're still under the influ influence of uh, ramping up glutamate transmission and, and, and dampening down GABA transmission. Okay, um, so that, anyway, that, that's a lot. What are the, some of the other things that uh, we can see with uh, chronic uh, alcohol uh, use, um, you know, uh, the, the other big part of our body that we tend to downregulate, uh, uh, other than, you know, our, our neocortex and, and eventually moving down into the paleocortex and, and further down the brain in threat uh, is the gastrointestinal system. So uh, a lot of alcohol ingestion can really cause havoc with the gastrointestinal system, not just the liver, but you know, you get reflux and reflux esophagitis, gastritis, and you're uh, going to start actually uh, uh, catabolizing uh, some of the uh, gut tissue and you can get uh, ulcers as well. So we want to keep that in mind. We're also, you know, you're going to see alcohol threat uh, related condition down regulate the reproductive system uh, as well. So. Uh, in, and in general, many of the hormones are, go are going to get uh, shut down. So, um, you know, you're going to uh, see uh, more things like hypotestosteronism and, uh, and, and hypoestrogenism, things like that. Uh, hypogonadism are also uh, uh, going to be involved um, in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, you know, perhaps you see some catabolism of bone, but more importantly, you're going to see some catabol catabolism of, of uh, muscle and muscle wasting uh, in alcoholics. Uh, um, you know, in severe ones, they won't even have enough dorsal muscles to hold themselves upright. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then talking about the fatty acid oxida uh, oxidation process, when that's inhibited, 
uh, and, we're, and we're consuming calories including alcohol, which is a good caloric source, um, we don't have a good way uh, of, of uh, 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 burning our, our fat. So um, uh, we will start to store fat. So you're gonna see the centripetal fat, the beer belly, uh, will uh, be stored and, and then eventually you're gonna start seeing uh, over storage of fat in the liver and alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, or as I like to call it, threat uh, uh, liver disease, because uh, there are other threat conditions that can cause a fatty liver as well. And then, and then you also are going to see some autonomic changes uh, that uh, occur uh, under threat conditions. So, uh, most classically, a higher blood pressure, perhaps a higher heart rate. Uh, you may see a little bit more autonomic autonomic instability and, and myocardial irritability and arrhythmias are common with uh, chronic alcohol use. So, um, you know, as we, you know, look at this uh, sort of more globally, we can kind of go, okay, I get it. Uh, this is a threat. We're going through the classic threat response and uh, we're going to be uh, more inflamed, right? We're going to be more catabolic. We're going to have a period where we're going to be more adrenergic, sympathetic nervous system activity that may not be sustained. It, you know, we'll be we'll have some mobilization kind of responses and high blood pressure and heart, high heart rate. But as things uh, start to deteriorate, we may actually see the immobilization end of a threat response with um, you know lower heart rate and and. Uh, um, a lower metabolic rate, uh, which you know can also have its own uh, problems uh, and is of concern. Um, so let's um, let's let's uh, just go back to the brain for a second because that's such a huge topic in, in all of this of what may be happening there. We want to again talk about the fact that toxins or threat will shut down uh, the the uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, early, uh, you know, first, first and foremost. Uh, and again, the fact that shutting this guy, the medial prefrontal cortex down, actually gives us a little relief from this chronic chatter in our head of what we need to be and what we should be doing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that, you know, that, that benefit can be relatively short-lived. Uh, and then it can go further into the older cortex of the brain here where it starts to go offline. And let's go ahead and include uh, the cerebellum as a sort of a, uh, a pseudo uh, uh, cortical structure uh, that is responsible for uh, control of uh, motor movements and, and, and helps us with our balance and that type of thing. Um, so as you go, you know, initially uh, losing a lot of your, uh, uh, your prefrontal function, we talked about how that changes when we start getting in to shutting down the paleocortex, that's when uh, we, we start to uh, actually uh, kind of lose a little more of the sense of ourselves. Uh, there's a little bit more numbing of our emotions. We may get sort of further di dissociated and, and uh, perhaps even uh, depressed. Um, and then as it gets down, you know, in, into the midbrain and we're starting to, uh, you know, decrease production of dopamine, uh, decreased production of norepinephrine, decreased production of serotonin. Uh, we get somewhat immobile and very flat, depressed, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, anhedonic, uh, loss of, uh, lots of emotions, including pleasure, uh, can start to get pretty, pretty numb, um, you know, and then as it really progresses, you can, then you can get into the autonomic stuff with autonomic instability. Um, and that that's, it follows the chronicity of it, follows the progression of acute uh, alcohol intoxication as well. But the other thing that happens with chronicity uh, that we have to think about in so many neurodegenerative diseases, and I'll argue that chronic alcoholism is a neurodegenerative disease as well, is that we actually start to, you know, progressively uh, utilize some of these resources for the fight and flight. So. We, uh, we start deconstructing cells, and, and they go through programmed deconstruction or apoptosis uh, yeah, for re, uh, repurposing, you know, reallocating resources in that way. So we can see, you know, shrinkage in brain areas from that process. And then there's the other issue that's not an organized uh, program 
uh, uh, deconstruction of cells, it's simply toxicity to cells, that the, that the alcohol concentrations can just kill the cells. So you can also see, and that may be a little bit more random, but you can also see uh, a, lot, a, a loss of, uh, of uh, neurons and, uh, and uh, astrocytes and glial cells uh, in the brain, loss of brain volume simply from the toxicity of the alcohol, not from a program process related to the threat response. So that's really scary, and that uh, you know, obviously could take a long time to be able to recover from, from uh, uh, that kind of brain injury. Okay, so let's uh, shift gears here a little bit now and talk about um, the use of uh, chronic alcohol. We can develop some tolerance to alcohol, and when we develop a tolerance to it, and we're trying to get you know, some, some relief, uh, we're trying to get the effect of alcohol. That means we have to consume more alcohol, perhaps consume it at a more rapid rate, but also in more volume to get that feel of, uh, of uh, a dopamine surge and, and, and kind of relief. Uh, and and um, so I think there's a very simple explanation for tolerance, and it is the fact that this, that, uh, this is a toxin uh, but it, it, it's a toxin that we're used to, that our bodies are familiar with because the bacteria in our gut, uh, when they undergo some fermentation process, will produce low levels of, of alcohol. And so we do have an enzyme in us. Um, some of us have more uh, you know, of it and some of us have a, a, a better genetic code for the production of it, but, but we all have uh, some alcohol dehydrogenase uh, available to us to um, to um, break down alcohol that's particularly been produced in our own gut. So you can imagine if you are, you know, producing more uh, alcohol that your your system will then upregulate uh, the enzyme to break it down. So if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, um, you know, if you're, you're going to upregulate your alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, and uh, and you're going to be more efficient at breaking down alcohol and uh, therefore you're again going to have to consume more and perhaps even consume it at a higher rate to get an effect from it and that's uh, one of the problems where you know tolerance um, quickly uh, goes to dependence on it uh, uh, and we must recognize that uh, uh, the, there can be even though it, it takes longer to get an effect from it uh, um, you know, the, the uh, al alcohol's uh, 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 concentration may be spiking and then coming down faster, and so you're still going to have some pretty extreme toxic effects uh, from alcohol consumption, even as you develop tolerance. And then the, there's also the receptor model for alcohol, where, you know, you may see a change in, in receptor density. Uh, but uh, in, in this model, um, we're not really theorizing that alcohol uh, acts uh, so much directly at uh, receptor sites that, uh, that receptor modification is a major factor in tolerance. I think the easy explanation is upregulation of the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme to break down alcohol to acetaldehyde. Um, okay, so. Um, now that the, the next thing to talk about is, is, the, is the cravings and, and, and uh, with the chronic alcohol use, what, what's driving those cravings? And, and again, um, uh, we can look at it uh, in terms of you know, receptors that are you know, craving alcohol, but I, I, again, I don't, I, I don't think that's the proper model uh, for what's actually going on with alcohol. Uh, cravings. I, I think what it is happening is when you consume the alcohol, your body perceives it as a toxin and most notably the brain perceives it as a toxin and it, it, uh, and it shuts down uh, these functions of, of the brain. And so once we have sort of that um, uh, separation uh, and, and that relief, uh, you know, that feels pretty good. But as we metabolize the alcohol and it goes out of our system, what we are left with is um, elevated uh, cytokines 
and elevated glutamate with relative absence of these other more calming feel-good neurotransmitters. So as we're coming back online, so to speak, we talked about going through this gradual dissociation or dissolution uh, of the brain. As we're coming back online, we kind of naturally um, go through uh, a reverse, dis a reverse um, dissolution process, and so we're going to go through an anxiety phase because we know that glutamate and, and these uh, threat cytokines make us feel anxious. They are part of uh, you know, uh, uh, mental health issues and anxiety disorders. And so if they're elevated, we're gonna have various uh, sensations in our body. You know, We're gonna be more irritable, we're gonna be more anxious. If they get really high, we're gonna be more depressed and shut down. Um, so we're going back up through this process and, and we get here and we go, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really anxious. I need to relax, okay? And so a logical ch uh, choice is then is to say, man, I'd really like to have that alcohol. And, and, and so we can not only take the alcohol to, you know, uh, shut down the anxiety response by shutting down some of the awareness part of our brain, but perhaps even get a little further bump of some dopamine to come out. And so you can get into that um, self-treatment pattern or, you know, with, with, with what a craving would be uh, of going back uh, to the alcohol to get relief. So, so then that, uh, that craving kind of pattern, I think is, is what we can then sort of extrapolate forward into actually what happens in uh, a withdrawal process, which, you know, might be the extreme of craving. Uh, and uh, so um, withdrawal symptoms, you know, really go beyond just feeling anxious and agitated and wanting to control that. Um, but arguably they too are uh, a uh, uh, pro-threat cytokine uh, uh, state. Uh, the symptoms are, are pro-threat cytokine symptoms. Uh, and they are also uh, uh, a high glutamate, uh, low GABA, low dopamine, low serotonin kind of state. Um, so we, we've discussed in other talks all the different symptoms that uh, cytokines can produce uh, in the body. Um, but uh, let, let's talk specifically about uh, uh, withdrawal type symptoms. And, uh, and you can see how they re relate really well to, uh, uh, to what cytokines do. You know, very commonly people feel a little nauseous with, uh, with withdrawal. So nausea um, is the cytokines working way down here in the brain stem. Uh, very frequently people have headaches and you know, we've done a whole thing on migraine headaches and, and uh, cytokines and glutamate. Um, people can feel agitated as well. They may have even a little bit of hypervigilance uh, and insomnia is extremely common. You know, as, uh, as your, your, uh, uh, your striatum starts to uh, fire up again under the influence of, of glutamate, you may get a little bit of a tremulousness. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we're, we're talking about the adrenergic responses a while ago, the sympathetic responses. Uh, that you see again that the uh, both of these guys are going to play into uh, in increasing an adrenergic response as things are coming back online we're going back through that reverse uh, dissolution process and so you're going to have things like goose flesh and sweating and uh, high heart rate uh, even perhaps high blood pressure um, but you can also have a little bit of autonomic instability and be a little prone to having arrhythmias. Now what's going on kind of deeper down in the brain uh, in there uh, as, uh, as everything is kind of uh, fired up and hyper excitable in the brain with uh, too much glutamate and some of its cousins caused by the threat response and the threat cytokines uh, uh, breakdown products of these other neurotransmitters, uh, kinuric acid and quinolinic acid, cousins of glutamate you are got a super excitable brain. And so that's gonna, uh, and, 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 and with this, uh, you know, little bit of dissociation and a, and a super excited brain, that's a, a setup for hallucinations. So hallucinations are very common. 
And then uh, finally, you know, as the cortex starts to wake up uh, and is in this hyper uh, uh, glutaminergic state, hyper adrenergic state, hyper sort of cytokine state, uh, you're at risk for having uh, seizures. And that's basically kind of withdrawal. And what we usually use to, to treat um, uh, the withdrawal symptoms of alcohol uh, is uh, GABA type medications. You know, people have used baclofen, but more commonly, you're going to use a benzodiazepine, you know, the, the Libriums, Valiums, Ativan, Xanaxes to help. Uh, manage uh, through uh, that uh, transitional time. And I think that's where we get the feeling that uh, alcohol is highly gabinergic is because we can, you know, sort of calm the brain uh, with, uh, with GABA and we think that's exactly what's happening with alcohol. I, I, don't, I don't buy into that. It doesn't make uh, a lot of sense to me. Okay. Um, so that, that's kind of what I wanted to uh, get to in, in, in this talk, uh, is that uh, the whole spectrum of alcohol falls into uh, uh, a threat response, and uh, um, then the option is, you know, if we want to calm this system, right, uh, you can take more booze, but and it will kind of push everything back, you know, down this pathway and take uh, the awareness of the toxicity out of our brains, okay? So that can feel pretty good. Um, but, and I'll also say in chronic alcoholism, because dopamine gets so depleted, it's really hard to get that euphoric effect. So many addicts are not actually now trying to tr get that euphoric effect, they'd like it, but they're actually just trying to control the anxiety of, of coming out of this state. So um, the euphoria can, can kind of go, uh, go away with, the, uh, with chronic use of alcohol when you, you just don't have much dopamine or serotonin coming forward. And, uh, and what you're really treating is the discomfort versus um, seeking the, the, the high of alcohol at, at that point. But, but what else can we do to, you know, kind of change that dynamic? Well, we just talked about using the gabinergics to calm the system, uh, to increase the sort of inhibitory aspect to counter the glutamate. Um, but uh, another big piece of this is Alcoholics Anonymous and their model. So what is, what is their model all about? Well, it's a, it, it goes right to our threat column. You know, it, if the threat uh, system is, all, is you know, all kind of the same, more or less, the, the spiritual uh, threats, the emotional threats, and the social threats are part of our threat load, but also uh, treating those is, is part of our safety mode that pulls us out of threat and pulls us out of this toxic physiology. So in, in an AA model, you're provided with a safe emotional and social environment, and that counters threat. That counters threat physiology and can counter the adverse effects of, of, of alcohol. So AA's got a great model that doesn't require a drug, right? Well, what, what else happens in AA is you're in this environment where you feel safe, you're allowed to be vulnerable, you're allowed to express yourself fully, and there's no judgment, right? There's no shaming, there's no advising, you know, there's, you know, the, but you get free expression in that environment. Well, free expression is the opposite of suppression and repression. And remember, we talked about this, this suppressive, repressive part of our brain being a major problem in uh, allowing our emotions to flow out. And when we give a little alcohol and shut that part of our brain down and stuff comes forward, including the dopamine and, and, and less so the serotonin, we feel really good. So AA has figured this out without having to use a drug and, and I think that's kind of really important uh, in this model. Now I do want to make a, a couple more com comments before shutting it down. So here's one of the, one of the problems is, um, is that the brain's been significantly affected by chronic alcohol use, and so it's gonna take some time to bounce back. We talked about the 
the program shutting down of cells, the apoptosis, and we talked about the more severe effect of just direct alcohol toxicity on cells and killing off brain cells. And so, uh, you know, with chronic use, this isn't going to come back really quickly. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time. And, you know, uh, with chronic alcohol use and, and even in that withdrawal period, people uh, can be in kind of that immobilization state uh, where their, uh, you know, their cytokines are pretty high and they're pretty depressed. They may be kind of numb and uh, anhedonic. They're not going to move around too much. Uh, but in going through this re reverse dissolution process, they're going to have to transition to come out of it through a period of anxiety and agitation, and they need to be supported through that. But I will say it's in that window of going from, you know, sort of that, that low energy depressed mood to a higher energy, but not feel good mood, feel really crappy because you're anxious and agitated, that um, people may have more initiative, more, uh, you know, mobilization, uh, where they're gonna be at higher risk for relapse. And that's still a very uncomfortable, not feeling well type of state. And unfortunately in that window, you know, some people can still feel pretty hopeless, but have uh, enough in, in, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, activation uh, and impulsivity as well that goes with uh, a threat state uh, that uh, not only is uh, um, uh, re-consuming, uh, a problem, but suicide is also a high risk in that window. And the problem is everybody's so different. You know, you don't know, you can't say, well, at four weeks, we got to be really watching. You don't know when people are going to hit that window for sure. So they need to be supported throughout. They need to be checking in with people. They need to feel vulnerable and safe enough to say, hey, I'm you know, I'm not doing well. I feel like I might relapse, or I, I, I feel like I, I can't go on anymore. Uh, and, uh, and and certainly then, you know, using these strategies to, to keep things moving in a positive direction. So that's all I've got on that. Thanks very much.